Right. So good morning and welcome to the November 4th version of Fridays with Fiscal. Um, this morning we will have Amanda Folkman. Uh, she'll be going over the USS portion. I will be going over the payroll portion and Michelle will be going over the inventory portion. Um, I just wanted to give you a little heads up. I know you're gonna all just love this information, but including today, there are only eight more Fridays until Christmas. So just an FYI, just wanna let everybody know that. So um, let's go ahead and get started. So Amanda, if you wanna go ahead and share your screen and we can get started with USAS recap. Okay. All right. Sorry, you pulled a fast one on me there, Lori. <laughs> I was seeing your screen, so I thought we were switching up the order. But um, okay, yeah. But USAS is right at the top of the page, so we'll get started here. Um, the first thing uh, right off the bat is we see our um, different releases. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you all, USAS is going to be pretty quick today. Um, we had three releases that happened during the month of October. It was um, two regular releases and a hot fix that came out towards the end of the month. Um, but uh, a couple of things here to start with. We have the bug fixes. Uh, this first one, um, and just a second here. Okay, so this first one corrected a problem that prevented removing the budget ledgers when June is reopened. So you might remember seeing an email from us where um, we had said, you know, hey, for right now, please have your districts hold off on closing the month of June. We spotted a problem. So this bug fix is where we went in and corrected that um, so that, you know, they can, it's totally fine if they do need to go back now and reopen um, and reclose June once they have that release installed. The other one, so this was to remove a debug comment from the application log. I checked into the JIRA issue on this one, and it basically just removes an info row from, like, if you were to look in that application log uh, that was previously added just each time the account grid was loaded. So kind of just like a cleanup thing um, there. I think that was just something from a long time ago that was, that was in the software, and we just went in and took out because it was unnecessary. Okay, so next are patches. We did have a patch to, um, and so the patch is for one specific district. They know who they are. We were in communication. Um, we had to remove a requisition from workflows because uh, it was it got unsynced somehow, and it was like a very specific situation, a very specific problem, um, where we went in and we removed this requisition just from the workflow side since it wasn't synced. It was like intended to be deleted, if I remember correctly. Um, so we do also, I, I do know with that one, we had also created an issue to help on the, um, on the USAS, USPS side to, with like the workflows project to make a way that maybe we can prevent needing to have a patch for that in the future. So, um, you know, that patch was, was enacted, but we also had some other plans associated with it to, um, to prevent that. All right, and that brings us to improvements. So this first one that I want to talk about, um, and we'll go in and look at these rules um, now that we're down here, but we created a rule to prevent posting budgeting transactions if the accounts are inactive. And um, this came out in October. Um, so we actually have here, let's go in, get in here. And I'm going to system rules. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna pop in the description here. I'm typing inactive and let me zoom in just a little bit. 
So if we look in this rules grid, there are a lot of inactive account. Oh, actually, maybe let's do account. Switch down to those. So there are a lot of inactive account rules. And what this does in the system, if certain things happen, if they try and post a requisition or if they try and post a receipt against an account that's inactive, then the system is able to flag that and tell them, you know, hey, you're trying to post something to an account that you've made in the system as not an active account. So um, these two new rules are at the top here. And we can see this says for anticipated revenue and for budget. And what the intention of these rules are is posting a budget transaction, which would be like a budget adjustment to an inactive account would then also, you know, so there's this rule that's available for posting a budget adjustment. And this had come up um, perhaps like if they're posting budgets, you know, maybe they don't want to um, have like um, inactive uh, accounts uh, be, be posted budgets to and not realize it. Um, I have a question by Andrew, are, are any of these turned on by default? So the two new ones, they are turned on by default. Um, but I have my columns here. And so bundled means they're turned on. Um, they are not mandatory though. So they can be disabled. Um, and if you have districts, certainly that, you know, maybe they use their inactive accounts, like they still want to be able to post budget accounts, budget adjustments, regardless, they can go in and turn these off. They're not required. Now, we did find, um, and I sent an email out about this yesterday. We did, we did have some reports that this rule isn't working exactly as intended. We do have a bug issue to go back in and correct this rule. So I've also included that on here. Um, if they try to post budget, uh, budget, um, like initials, if they try to apply for proposed amounts right now, it's getting an error that says a rollback error. It says, it says something like transaction silently rolled back, which obviously that's not the intention. If they have inactive accounts, we want them to know which accounts are inactive because then, you know, maybe they don't want to post to those or maybe they want to go activate those. Um, so that error is definitely, you know, not ideal and it doesn't help them um, locate those accounts. And then um, also we ran into if they just simply go to like the expenditure grid, for example, and they tried to just make an account inactive, it's also hitting this validation and then recognizing that the account is inactive, but you're making it in the step that you're making it inactive. So it's very odd. It definitely shouldn't do that. So, you know, we are, I am very sorry for the inconvenience. I, I know I've had some tickets and talked to some of you all about it. Um, but there, the workaround is to go in and disable these. So again, they're not mandatory. Um, what that looks like if you run, if you have a district that runs into this issue, um, come in here and find the rule. You would click edit, just uncheck this box, save. And there are two, there's one for the budget side and the anticipated revenue side. Um, you know, you can just go ahead and disable both of them if you want. Um, if, you, if you're coming in here to do this for an error, if it's an expenditure account, then the budget one is going to at least be able to, to clear that error, anticipated revenue for, for revenue accounts. Um, and then once you uncheck to enable it, you do have to remember to click this activate button on the rules grid in order to, to put that change in action in your software. And that just loads for um, for a little bit here as it as it just makes sure that everything's updated. Um, and I did put the JIRA issue right on here um, that we have for correcting those new budgeting rules. So if any of you want to, you know, keep an eye on that, watch it. Um, so we'll get that. We'll get that updated. Um, I am curious. So, you know, based on Andrew's question, like if they're turned on by default, I know that the team had discussed like when implementing this issue, if um, it should be, you know, on if it should be mandatory you know and obviously they they decide like you don't have to have it on but it'll be on by default if any of you all have feedback on how you feel about that like if you know i mean obviously it's not ideal in this situation because it turned out there is kind of an issue with it but but once this rule is fixed if you have any thoughts on like 
if you think your districts would want it to be mandatory or I'm, I'm sorry, not mandatory, um, on by default or off by default, let me know. And I, and I can always pass that information along. Um, okay. This next one, okay. So we remove the ability to select columns that appear in the report bundle grids. And um, so this one, you know, it sounds very odd, but basically we found, we had a situation where um, there were some uh, some situations, and this is right in here in these report bundles. And um, I can just create one here. These are the grids that this is talking about. And previously there was like a little drop down box here. And so, you know, you have these grids that have the report name, report title, report options. And it's kind of just a consistency thing, like as when it was first implemented with the software where, you know, all of these grids, you can kind of like check, uncheck what you want to see. And so they were on here, but we found that there were some users that they all of a sudden like could like they were missing columns and they couldn't get it back so it was basically causing a bug for some users that that they were you know adding and removing some of these columns but um we reviewed and said well the intention is for them to be able to see all of these things you know it's not like a normal grid like a purchase order grid where there's a bunch of different information you can take on or take off so we said, let's just get rid of that option. You know, we um, made sure that this does fix it for anybody that was experiencing problems. Um, and then, um, yeah, as you can see, the little check box, that um, drop down is gone. So um, we removed that um, just out of the software. And then these last two kind of go together. These two are from the hot fix. So the hot fix that happened on October 28th. Um, these are both related to the duo two-factor authentication. And um, we had some reports, we had some discussions um, with some ITCs where um, this first one, uh, it was modified to only be required through the user interface. So we got some reports that um, third-party softwares um, they have different kind of links that they utilize with uh, USAS. And so there were cases where the duo two-factor authentication was um, interfering with their connection with the software. So um, and, and, um, in review, basically what we did is we said, okay, so um, only if a user is directly logging in, we need to have this... Um, this two-factor authentication step, but in a case where a third-party software is connecting, like SOAP calls or um, report direct down or direct report downloads, um, which I believe is the report link. So when they click on a report link and just have to log in, then it's not requiring that two-factor authentication step to prevent some of the issues with linked items. Um, and then the other part of this is the two-factor authentication flag. Um, so that it's on the user record and most, so that user record, you know, previously it was just something that could be modified by um, system admin or by admin accounts. Um, we added an ability where there's a limited user permission that USAS managers have where they can add things like account filters or, um, if they use workflows, they can do the workflow groups, they can control like um, their balance checking. Well, any users that had that limited access when this first, um, when the duo was first implemented, they also did have access to this two factor authentication flag. And when it came up in the context of like third parties, um, you know, wanting this, like having it interfere, then it was like, well, the managers could technically turn this off. And, you know, obviously that was a concern. So um, if I go in here, I'll show you what I'm talking about. So I'm going to log out as my admin user. I'm going back in as a, a, like a USAS manager role. So this might be like my treasurer, or assistant treasurer, anybody at the district who can like close the posting periods is usually how I think of it. Okay, 
So if I go to system users and um, I could come in to just like a standard user here. Oh, yeah. And uh, so I could come in, I have access to some fields like, you know, the name, I could add an email. I could choose an account filter for this person um, and, and certain fields here. But there are a lot of um, these fields that have to do with like, you know, if it's locked or if you are setting them up for external authentication. And these are things that can be updated by a system manager or by an admin. Um, and this box now, this two-factor authentication, I'm clicking this and it's not getting checked. It, it won't let me. So um, obviously I can see whatever the status is, but if it was checked, it would be grayed out how this enabled box is. So we locked that down um, as part of this hot fix as well. Um, and then just uh, we had an internal um, an internal update and stuff too. So that that one is just something that's going to be in the background that um, you won't notice in the software. Okay. Well, that's all I have for you, SAS. So. Uh, a little bit, a little bit less quick than I thought, Lori. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I will stop sharing here and turn it back over to you. Righty, and I will go ahead and get my screen set up here. Well, pull everything down. All right, uh, where are you? There we go. <clears throat> okay, so let me scroll down to the the payroll releases. And we had uh, two regular releases and one hotfix release. Glory, uh, we're, so, we're not seeing your screen. Oh, you're not seeing it? Hold on. Let me go back and share. Hold on here. Where'd it go? Uh, hold on. There we go. All right, let me try this again. I think, I've, there we go. How's that, better? It looks like it's coming up. It's loading for me, but okay. I, think we're, yeah. I think we're on the right path. There we yeah. go. I, okay, yeah, good I know to go. what I did. I forgot to click share after I clicked the screen that I wanted. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay, so um, again, we have uh, two regular releases and a hot fix. So we're gonna go ahead and go over the bug fixes that we did first. Um, we had multiple bug fixes that we corrected on the W-2 form printing. Uh, one of them was uh, box 19, which is the year-to-date deduction totals from the city payroll records. They were not populating correctly, so we corrected that when, we're, uh, when W-2, uh, W-2s are printing. Um, but if somebody has multiple uh, items that span across a second form, so maybe like multiple city records, uh, multiple state records, something like that, and it, it requires a second form to be created, that was not happening. The overflow, overflow forms were not being produced. So we corrected that. Now those will be included when W-2 uh, printing is, is being processed. Um, if there were no employees on the report, so basically it was blank, it didn't tell you that, that it was blank. You know, it just it would open up and then it would just stay open, blank. No, no employees were listed on the report. So we corrected that. Um, if uh, the user was using Google Chrome or Microsoft Edge document, when you're processing W-2 uh, forms, you could see all of the employee information, but if you were using the uh, Adobe Acrobat, uh, you'd only see like the first employee and then blank form for the remaining employees. So only the field headings were showing. So other than that, there was no employee data. So we had to make a correction for that. And then some of the box 12 codes, you know, uh, like your uh, cost over, Hold on, let me look here. Let me go back. Oh, never mind. I gotta gotta go back and restate that. Some of the box twelve codes amounts for uh, were missing for certain employees, and those were basically coming from adjustment journals for like 
uh, the, to the federal record for like adoption assistance, life insurance, those things where they had to add adjustments, those were missing from the box 12. And then another thing that uh, regarding box 12 is uh, several items, if they have many items, they were not overflowing. And those are related to like your um, code D, code E, code F, all those extra codes that are actually um, included on the W-2. So we corrected that. And then we also had the state items that were not overflowing. That all kind of wraps into one as far as that overflowing forms problem. So that's all been corrected. So now if there's overflows, an overflow page should be corrected for a W-2. Um, another correction that we made, we found it was a bug, is um, when an employee was in advance, uh, the pay report was not showing the advance air adjustment amount for the employer amount when they were in the, the advance. So we did get that corrected. So next fiscal year, that should not be an issue. Um, on the employee distributions, when uh, the districts were processing the, the retirement items, so like your SARS or STRS, and if they, the employee had more than one, like they, let's say they had position level SERS uh, records, as well as like all other job positions, if they had multiple, then um, on that employer distribution, uh, there was a problem with the, the uh, amounts that were showing up on the report for the position level. The position level grows was not was not accurate as far as what was being withheld for the employee. So we had to make a correction to that. So that should all be fixed now. So if they have multiple uh, retirement payroll items and they have some set up by position, the the, to, the, the figures on the employer distributions, the employer distribution should now be accurate not including anything that wasn't picked up by the employer. Um, the earnings register previously avoided refund transactions were not showing on the earnings register, but we've corrected that. So whoops, hold on, let me get out of this. We go into the right session. I'm gonna show you what I'm referring to. So if I go in and void a payment for an employee, previously on the earnings register, that was not showing as a voided transaction. It was still just showing as a transaction amount on the employee. So if I go, I'll just go in and void a, a check for this or a payment for this employee. So let's just do this one. Just put today's date. Okay, so now when I go in and look at this pay, payment, well, there's two 930 payments, but when I go in and run the earnings register for this employee, I should see, get rid of this. Avoided payment now on there. You can see right here, it now lists voided payment. Previously, it was not listing that. If they were voided, it was still just showing on, on the report as the payment. So that has been updated. So that's something that we did fix as well. Um, let's see what else. What else have we done? Let's go back here. Um, we we made an update to the payroll items. What was happening is if an, employee, if an employee went in to say a payroll item and did an error adjustment, and for some reason they went in and just deleted that payroll item, basically not deleted, just like archives it. But what was happening is it was allowing it. Well, because there's an error adjustment on there, it should not have been allowing it. So if I go back in here, let's just go into a payroll item a new payroll item. So I'll go into this one here. 
And I'm going to go ahead and just put enter in an error adjustment. Oh, never mind. I already have one there. Okay, so if I go in, I'm just going to save it. If I go in and try to delete that record, which is this 550 annuity, if I try to delete it, I'm going to get a message and it's telling me that that object is referenced, so it can't be deleted. So that's the, that's what we added. So you cannot delete that uh, payroll item record until that error adjustment is either removed or it has been paid or withheld. Right. Um, the mass change service for the payroll item error adjustments, which we'll talk about in a little bit, but the payroll item error adjustments was something that we added. So let me go back in here. So you can see we have payroll item, we have error adjustment and employer error adjustment. So I'll just go to the error adjustment screen. All right. And when someone was trying to mass load like um, a rate for, uh, for a payroll item, there was a problem. It wasn't allowing them, allowing it to do it. So what we did is we corrected that. So I'll just go in here and let me filter out. Let me just try to find uh, the 520 payroll items. All right, so here are my 520 payroll items. And then if I wanna go in and do a mass change, and I've already created the script, so I'm just doing a payroll item refund. So we're wanting to refund this payroll item for everyone. You know, everybody, you know, paid 50 cents too much or $50 too much. So what I did is I just created this script to actually update that record to put that error adjustment amount on each of these 520 payroll items. So I'm going to go ahead and hit the execution button and submit it. And like I said previously, it was causing an issue loading, so it would not load the data and an error would be produced. But now I can go in and take a look at all of those employees. And you can see I put the $50 error adjustment on every single record using the mass change option. Now that will work when we're using that in the payroll item error adjustment screen. Um, the EMIS contractor with a missing compensation was preventing the extract report from completing. So basically, if the, if the uh, compensation field was blank, the, the report or the extract, I should say, would not process at all. And then we also found, too, that um, there was a problem if the record was, the compensation record was pointing at an old compensation, let's say from like the previous fiscal year, it will, it might put it, it wouldn't put it on the report. And they would say, well, this person is missing from the report. Well, what we did is um, we updated that. So when you're in the EMIS entry records, the, the CJ, the contractor records, what you can do is you can go in, find the employee, and go into the modify. So if this was blank previously, you would have been able to select the current compensation record. Now, right now, this legacy record was from the prior fiscal year. So if I went in and tried to, tried to create the extract report, when I do that, what's going to happen? is I will, whoops, hold on here, pulling over something I don't want, go back in. What it's doing is giving me a blank report. And that's because that, that compensation record that is chosen on that CBA record is from the prior fiscal year. Now, if I go in and correct that and choose the correct fiscal year, which would be 23, 23, and save it. If I go back in to process that C, the extract for the CJ data, I go back in and save that record. Now, my report will contain the data for that employee. 
So again, um, the record, that record compensation field cannot be blamed and it has to be the current fiscal year. You have to choose it. I mean, if districts want to, they could go in and delete all the records and recreate and re-add, but it's a lot easier if the records are already out there to just go in, as long as the position number is the same, just go ahead and change the compensation information and then create the extract record. We had some improvements. Um, one of the improvements that we made was extract the payroll item error adjustments into a new entity. And that's what I was talking about previously. We've had some mixed reactions to this, um, but just so everyone knows, like the, the new error adjustment screen, the payroll item error adjustment screens are basically out there um, to make it a little bit easier to see when an error adjustment was actually paid. Because when you do an error adjustment on the payroll item itself, once it was paid or withheld, it's gone. That's it, no more. While with the payroll item error adjustment and employer error adjustment screen, you can actually see when they have been truly paid because it has the date information. And again, that helps, helps you with your filtering as far as like um, the process and outstanding error adjustments. So maybe you want to take a look at and see which ones are outstanding, what's going to be pulled in on this payroll. And the nice thing about it is you can interact with the payroll item error adjustment on the payroll item itself. So you could still go in and add the error adjustments on the payroll item. When you do that, it actually puts that right over into the payroll error adjustment screen or the employer error adjustment screen itself. So let me just kind of go in and show you because sometimes it's easier. I'm a visual person. So usually it's easier to uh, see it than talk about it. So I'm just gonna go into the payroll um, item here. And you can see here's the error adjustment and the employer error adjustment options. So I'll go into the payroll item itself. And I'm just going to go in. Let's just go into this 591 error adjustment for Brett Hurst. We're going to add, whoops, maybe an error adjustment for him. And let's just say he's going to get back $100. And save that. Now, one thing you will notice when you do that, this is only the employee. We have the error, the board error adjustments or employer error adjustments are no longer on this screen. But I can go in now to the payroll item error adjustment record. Oops, maybe. <clears throat> Let me find him. Oops, I can spell it. There we go. Here's the 591. And you can see all error adjustments that are currently sitting out there. So you can see the one that I just added for the 591. It's right here. So that comes from the error adjustment on the payroll item. But like I said, if I wanted to use this screen and just add one here instead, I'll go back into the 591 again. And this time I will add $300. I use the same date. And then I can go back in to the payroll item and see, again, they work with each other. Once I get to that screen, kind of being slow. And let me go back into his payroll item here. And you can see there it's there. So there's the one I entered in on the payroll item screen. Here's the one I entered in on the payroll error adjustment screen for the employee. And like I said, the really nice thing about this payroll error adjustment and employer error adjustment, you can filter for employees. You can filter for anything that might be out there on the under payroll error adjustments. So if you wanted to find anything that was out there for the 591s, you could actually do that. I could pull that up, there it is. And then, like I said, the nice thing about it is 
once these items have been withheld from the payroll or refund, you can actually see this, this paid, uh, paid box will be checked with the date that it was paid. So that also be listed as well. <clears throat> and you have several choices on the grid as well. You can pull the date paid, all that information. So maybe you want to filter for error adjustments for the 591 that were you know, paid on a certain date. You can do that. Um, another improvement that we made, um, let's see, what is this? Oh, the SOAP service, it was uh, return, it returns the period beginning uh, date and payroll ending date with the payments that are processed during the payroll. So before they weren't returning the correct dates and that was affecting the kiosk pay slips. So we made a correction to that so that information now gets pulled correctly and the kiosk pay slips will pull in accurately. <clears throat> Another improvement that we made, um, the payable summary report as well as the payables detail report are now available in Excel and CSV format options. So that's a really nice feature. And uh, as Amanda had stated, the duo, uh, the duo two-factor authentication information was updated as well. So basically, uh, that is only required when someone is logging into the system um, for SOAP calls and then report downloads, like Amanda said, if you're going in, it doesn't require you to enter uh, the, the duo two-factor authentication. So uh, same thing applies to payroll. We have some new features. Um, one of them is the new uh, pay distribution grid, which is out there under core. You can see it says pay distributions new. And the nice thing about this, it's similar to when we added the pay accounts new uh, grid. It gives you a lot more information. Um, you can filter on a lot more information as far as an employee. Uh, if you wanted to filter on, let's say a routing number. So maybe I want to find the 5032752268 routing number. Anybody that has that routing number, I can easily filter on that and it gives me all of the information on the screen. I could run, you know, just look at that information. I was going to say I can run a report, but you can't quite yet. This is another uh, feature that we will be adding to, just like the pay accounts grid. We're going to be adding the report option and some other features as well. So, but right now, at least you have this information pulling up and it makes it a lot easier to find information instead of having to go into the pay distributions, go into the employee record, drill down, find the information. All of it's right here, it's available. So that's a really nice feature that we added. <clears throat> we also added the W-2 form printing. So now when you go out to reports and go to W-2 report and submission, you'll see that there is a W-2 pr printing tab right here at the top. And what this tab is used for, this will uh, give you the data so you can print out your, uh, your uh, legal size pressure seal W-2s. That's what this printing is for, this option. If you're wanting to print eight and a half by 11 forms, you're still going to be using the W-2 report option and using that forms uh, choice that we have out there. And we do have a, a few more things to come yet for W-2 re reporting. Um, one of them is they're going to set up a, a, a job to schedule the form generation. So like if you have a big, huge district, like you know, thousands of W-2s. That could take a long time to process because you're pulling a lot of information in. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be taking um, the jobs. We're going to be merging those PDFs and um, we're going to set that up so it processes in the background. So that way the district can still keep processing or, you know, working in the, in the system itself without having to sit there and wait for those uh, W-2s to be generated, to be created. So that will be a feature that we are adding. 
And then um, something else that we're going to be adding as well is a job to create individual PDFs for the kiosk, which is always needed. So uh, what it's gonna do, that job is going to create uh, individual PDFs for each employee and then store them in the file archive to access by the kiosk. So that information is all going to be created and then stored out in the archive. So those are two things that we are working on and trying to get that information out there. <laughs> and then the final thing that we did is um, we created the year-to-date report replacement. We've had, we had a lot of requests for that. So we actually went out and we got that report created. And as you can see, um, you have the choice of including compensation information on the report, yes or no, including archived employees. If you only wanted to process the, the report for a single employee, you can do that by entering the employee information name here and then choosing the ad just to have that employee pull up. Or you can process it for everyone or particular pay groups or particular job statuses. Those are all available options. So I'm just gonna go ahead and generate the report because my test instance doesn't have that many employees in it. So it doesn't take that long to process, but you can see the report, it's very nice. I mean, they got it, it looks really, really nice. <clears throat> so here is what it looks like, uh, earnings and benefit statement for the calendar year. 2022, and that gives you the as of date, like what date you actually process this. So it gives you all the leave information, of the earnings, the compensation information, all the payroll items, and then all the totals. And it's, you know, each page is just one employee. I'm, and I'm thinking if an employee goes into more than one page, it will overflow as well. Um, does anyone have any questions? I think that's everything I have. Let me double check and make sure I didn't miss anything. Nope, I didn't miss anything. So does anyone have any questions? Let's see. Heidi, for that report, primary compensation flag needs set. Uh, which report are you referring to, Heidi? <clears throat> Sorry. You're good there. Yeah, the year to date report. So is it keying off of the um, primary flag on the compensation? I do not believe it is. I do not believe that is, but I will verify that with the with the developers. But I'm thinking not because I don't think I, I know in my test files, I don't have primary compensation set up on these people. Let me look. Okay, then and that's awesome. The only reason I ask is um at the top there on the documentation on the wiki which thank you by the way whoever did that um mm -hmm. it notes primary compensation information so that's what just triggered my mind to think oh i wonder if it's pulling from that or not so that's good to know right i will verify that with the with the developer but yeah this employee is on my report and he is not this is not set up as his primary compensation so I, my thinking is no, but if I okay. find out anything different, I will let you know on that. But yep. I'm pretty no sure. It's not. Yep. No worries. No hurry. Thanks, Lori. You're welcome. Any other questions? All right. I think we'll go ahead and turn it over to Michelle. If she wants to share her screen, we'll go from there. Thanks, everybody. No, Michelle, we're not hearing you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Now we can hear you. <laughs> Sorry. I always seem to have to change it for every Zoom meeting I have. I'm not quite sure. All right. Um, so, um, what we're going to get into is the uh, wonderful world of uh, inventory bug fixes, because that's all we really had um, in October. We had two regular releases and a hot fix. Um, so what I've done is I've kind of sorted this by the reports and transaction bugs 
um, I thought it would be easier to follow than kind of just going through what was on each release. Um, and so I'm just going to uh, talk about most of these. There's really not anything to show. Um, so we'll talk about this stuff and then we'll talk, we'll go back to our registration page afterwards and just talk about what's coming up here. Oh, so let's get started. Um, in reports, um, we've had a lot of um, issues uh, with um, some bug fixes and uh, most of these were due to migration balancing issues. Um, some unique situations um, and so we needed to apply that in um, those fixes to the software. Um, with our reports, just talking about um, a lot of these were, were mainly due uh, to gap uh, reporting issues here. And so um, the first four bullets are in regards to the gap reports. <clears throat> so the fixed asset by source report, um, it was updated uh, to look for the items asset fund if the acquisition code fund dimension is blank. So when you're you know, thinking of the acquisition record, you've got the account code listed in there. Um, and so if that acquisition account code fund is blank, if that fund cannot be determined, then the item is being listed on the report as an invalid fund. <laughs> and so um, we do have um, some improvements to be made on that. I know that uh, we've had um, some tickets come through with um, districts and auditors questioning the invalid fund showing, the word invalid showing on that fixed asset by source report. So this was something we talked about last Friday when we went through, excuse me, when we went through reports. Um, so we are um, going to, we have created a JIRA issue, which I'll talk about here next, um, that will go in and improve that. Um, <clears throat> so we also, excuse me, <clears throat> we also corrected a problem that was introduced on the 125 release. So we did a hot fix on the 125.1 that was causing those fixed asset by source amounts to be inflated um, incorrectly. So what was happening, the problem was caused when they were trying to retrieve the fund associated with an item when the acquisition fund was blank or zero and the fund dimension of the account code was left blank. So we had two strikes there. So this was corrected as well. Um, so and so the 125 fix fixed that um, and will display the fund's value on the report, even if the fund is not determined in underneath the core fund. Um, so again, um, we just need to be aware right now, if that fund dimension on the acquisitions account code is blank, um, and it's, you know, not showing up underneath, you know, core fund as well, um, it's going to currently show that as invalid, it's not going to show the fund code on the fixed asset uh, by source report it's going to show it as invalid. So Classic didn't have like an invalid on the fixed asset by source. So that's where after this came out and we got a couple tickets um, talking to the developers more, I'm like, we need to mimic this. So it um, so it's re you know reporting the same as it is in Classic. Um, so we need to update that. And that's what I explained last week. Um, we need to update that so it's reporting it like it is in classic. Um, so um, what we're doing with inventory issue 408 is we're going to improve this. It's not throwing the reports out of balance. It's just showing that amount underneath invalid. So um, in classic, it was appearing underneath acquisitions prior to system startup. So we need to better improve that um, so that it's reporting correct. It's reporting on the right section of the report. Um, so that is definitely something that is going to be taken care of here in the future. Um, schedule of changed and fixed assets report. So we had um, a couple issues in there that were that was cleaned up. 
The um, detail report was not including negative acquisitions, but the summary report was. So we corrected that. Uh, the function and asset class sort types on the report were not including adjustment amounts for transfers correctly. And it was um, showing them incorrectly in both the summary and the detail reports. So <clears throat> those were corrected as well to look at the fund transfers and include those amounts um, on, on the report. So that's been corrected. Also, um, transfer amounts, we updated the transfer amounts to be the original cost if there are no acquisitions for the item. So it wasn't reporting it correctly um, on the report. So we've updated that. So it's looking at that original cost as that transfer amount. Um, and so it's, it's displaying that properly now on that schedule of change and fixed assets report. So uh, the next one was the schedule of change in depreciation. So the summer report wasn't including all the acquisitions correctly. Um, so that's been fixed. Um, depreciation values for disposed of assets in the current fiscal year, what it was happening is it should show the depreciation amount up through the disposal date only. Um, so before it was calculating it for the entire year. So if I disposed of it in October of this year, it should show it to me throughout that up to that certain point. So that's how classic worked. So we've fixed that as well. Um, on both the schedule of change in fixed assets and on the schedule change in depreciation, the following were fixed. Um, we had a unique situation where an item that was acquired and disposed of in the same year, it wasn't reporting the acquisition amounts correctly. So that's been fixed. And disposition adjustments were showing up as a positive value on the reports instead of a negative. So we fixed that as well. So, you know, these type of things were causing balancing issues when they were trying to migrate. It wasn't like, wait a minute, you know, there should be a negative amount instead of a positive. And, and so um, that's, those have all been cleaned up. So those are the bug fixes that we cleaned up on the gap reports. Now, one of these also um, is going to be reflected on the book value. And I just talked about the disposition adjustments um, showing up. Um, also, let me see. So the um, depreciation, um, I'll start with the first bullet here. Um, we corrected a problem with fiscal to date depreciation. A fiscal to date seems to be a little pain point um, for us. Um, but we corrected a problem where fiscal to date depreciation was being calculated for items that were fully depreciated and had a life to date of zero. So um, it was still calculating that depreciation amount and they're fully depreciated. Um, so um, we fixed that. So those no longer show um, fiscal to date amounts. Also depreciation values. Um, for disposed of assets, um, so in the current fiscal year, should depreciation depreciate up through the disposal date. So that's kind of you know what we fixed underneath the schedule of change in depreciation. We also made sure that that is reporting correctly also on the book value. So um, so we made sure that now it's just depreciating up through that date that it was disposed of. So we did make a note in the release notes regarding this that if you had items that were displaying incorrect depreciation amounts because of this unique situation, um, that um, you could go in and if um, the previous fiscal year was closed, you can reopen and reclose to recalculate the depreciation values. Um, but for the current year fiscal year, year um, items, um, the depreciation is correct. And to confirm that, you can run a book value and compare it against the schedule of change and depreciation, and those amounts should, should be um, matching. So that's kind of the bug fixes um, that we had with these reports um, this um, last uh, month. And I know that we do have some 
um, tickets sitting out there right now from some of you regarding some still some depreciation balancing issues like from this year to the prior year. Um, so we our developer, in fact, they're kind of caught up with um, the next couple of releases on getting those um, issues done. Now they're just um, waiting for the QA team to test them. So we've put uh, one of the developers on support <laughs> to look at this stuff. Um, so he, I know we have um, a few tickets here that he's looking into regarding depreciation amounts, not balancing um, from the prior year to the next year, um, maybe a possible um, inflating um, the life to date amount. So he's looking into those right now. He's, he's not developing right now. He's doing support and looking into those. So hopefully we'll get some answers for those tickets, um, next week for you guys. So that is the bug fixes that, um, we have out there that have been resolved. And also, um, underneath, um, the items, um, underneath transaction items, the depreciate option. Um, it was updated to correct a problem with fiscal today depreciation. Now, this only impacted um, districts who had used that depreciate button. So the current year life to date depreciation is correct, but the fiscal to date depreciation was not calculating correctly for fully depreciated items, it was still calculating uh, fiscal to date. So we have fixed that. So for any of those districts that had incorrect depreciation due to this, we did put in the release notes. If they close the fiscal year, they can reopen and reclose. Um, and this is kind of similar to what I talked about in one of those reports, the way it was reflecting. Um, and also, um, to determine if there was a depreciate problem again, they can go in and run that schedule of change in depreciation or the book value after it was closed re and review those depreciation amounts. But that was all included in the release notes uh, for that. And I believe that was all on 1.2, let me look here, 1.25. Also with the depreciate option, we updated it to correct a problem with it not subtracting salvage values when that depreciate option was used. So if you had items that had salvage values, the calculated depreciation may not be correct. So those can be, that's been resolved. You can go in and select those items from the grid and rerun the depreciate button. Um, you can run it in projection first, see that make ensure that everything looks good, and then you can run it in actual again to update those. So those salvage values are subtracted off of those. Sure, how many districts um, use the salvage values anymore? But if they do and they did run the depreciate, um, they need to um, go in again and make sure to clean those up. Um, Update um, to require a lease type. If the acquisition method is uh, selected as lease, so it wasn't requiring that. So if they went in and created an item and they put in the acquisition method of leased, um, then we want to make sure that the lease type is also being um, enforced, that they have to select that as well. Um, so also, the calculation for setting an item as capitalized was updated to both look at the acquisition method and the lease type. So it wasn't looking at that. Um, so we wanted it to mimic the classic behavior on that. Um, and it all stemmed through um, these leases. Um, so we made sure that that now mimics what classic was doing. And we corrected the item migration import to show the true value of the acquisition date. So previously, when you, when you were importing an item, so this is through the migration, when they're migrating over, if the acquisition date was blank in the UI, it would display the current system date. So we have fixed that. So it's no longer doing that. 
And then we've also updated it too that capitalized assets with those blank acquisition dates are going to show under acquisition prior to system startup like they did in classic. So those were the um, bug fixes that were taken care of um, this in October. We had quite a bit. Um, our 127 release that should be coming out next week, hopefully midweek, is going to have some improvements made to especially the book value. We, we, we have received a lot of tickets regarding the sorting not working, and it's not. Uh, when you're going in and trying to sort the book value, it defaults on fund and then um, tag number. And so if you try to change it, you want to sort just by, you know, um, bunk or asset class, it, it'll then sort by fund take number asset class. That's not a very helpful way to sort. So we are majorly improving that um, so that what you sort on is what you sort on. And also um, that it's going to subtotal too on those fields that make sense to subtotal on. So that is the biggest um, probably enhancement that's going to be made on the 127 is that book value. Um, I know we have a couple other, um, I think another report too on there um, that's going to get fixed as well, some of the sorting capabilities. So, you know, we really, you know, want to get a lot of these um, bug issues that we have ironed out. And, you know, hopefully next calendar year, we're really going to be, you know, focusing on enhancing what's out there already and making improvements um, to, you know, how the reports are running. I know a lot of you have said we would, we would love to have spreadsheets and not just a PDF. I get that. So I think um, uh, those type of things will be hopefully addressed next calendar year, get that stuff out. Um, any questions regarding the bug fixes that took place during October in inventory. Michelle, what? I got a quick Yes, go uh, ahead. Um, so the last note on there, capitalized items with blank acquisition dates will show as the um, acquisitions prior to system startup. So I've got a ticket in right now because I've got, we, we didn't migrate, we did it by spreadsheet, but we've got, um, it's doubling the amount on that report by sources and it, part of it's going in the invalid, which because it didn't have uh, the fund structure, uh -huh. but it, if it also didn't have an acquisition date, then maybe that's why I've got it under both. Like it's being listed under both categories. Okay. It's doubling. I'm wondering if this is why I'm, I've got it in with uh, Jody, I think is working on it. Okay. Um, she was going to check with the developers, but it might have something to do with that last note. Well, I will, I will ask her about that, Deb, and I'll make note of this and say, hey, you know, I was on the call with Deb here, and um, we're wondering if this might be part of it. So, yeah, great. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Okay. Um, Michelle, I was going to. Yes. I was going to let everybody know. I added out in chat, but I just want to make sure in case someone didn't see it. I asked the developers about the primary compensation flag um, as and the year to date report, and they said no. That primary compensation flag does not need to be marked. He said that basically what it does it it takes the compensation with the most recent start dates on the primary position, basically the lowest lowest number of position that is active, inactive, terminated deceased based on the job status selection. And then it considers that to be the primary. So I, the overall answer in a nutshell is no, the primary compensation does not need to be marked. And I will update that in the documentation as well. Thanks. Thanks, Lori. So yeah, so when it comes to, you know, the bug fixes here, um, I think if, you know, you're just trying to recap what had happened. Um, last month with what's going on with some of these reports. So it might just be best just to kind of look through these and kind of, since I've kind of got them broken out by report um, to see what has been fixed on here. Okay. What I'm gonna do is just take you back to um, our training page. 
and we're getting close to the end of the year here. Um, next week, we are going to have our calendar year in review. And the reason I just want to let you guys know that it's not going to fall on a Friday. It's it's on a Thursday this year. So I just wanted to bring that to your attention um, that we are meeting on Thursday um, to go over um, our calendar review for both USAS and payroll. Um, and I think believe that starts at nine o'clock and that's going to take a little while too. So you need to book some time here to, um, um, to join us and we'll go through um, our year end information. And also um, we will get this updated to the supporting materials. Um, we'll get a link there too as well. Um, uh, we're working on that right now and getting everything up to date. So that link will be available closer to the meeting next week. Um, also, another thing I wanted to bring to your attention is at the end of the year, um, mid-December, we are going to have a session on ITC management application. Um, so for those of you that are going to be submitting on the behalf of your districts, um, we are going to be um, going through that application. Now, we have started a documentation manual, but there's nothing in it yet. Um, so I'm just going to click on that here. So here, and it's not open yet either because we're trying to uh, work on it right now. Um, but it will be found, I'll just go to our main page here, underneath the redesign documentation. It's going to be located here for the ITC management and the user manual is what you guys are going to see. Um, and so this is how it's going to be laid out. Um, and so what we're working on right now is getting the 1099 stuff um, documented. And then, so one person's working on that and then we've got uh, somebody else working on the other payroll related ones. Um, so yes, we're hoping to get um, some stuff out here soon, but uh, definitely have it all ready and documented for you guys before we meet on um, December 16th to talk about that. Um, we didn't want to wait until January because, you know, at the end of January, you guys are going to be using this. So um, we wanted to get it out there here in December and review this with you. So we did have another session in there. I think we had EMIS staff reporting. So we decided to... Uh, postpone that until next year and instead review that new application that we have out there. Um, so yeah, so these are the handful of um, training sessions we have left. And, you know, also just um, if there are certain ones that you feel that would really benefit all of us next year training sessions, um, when we send out the evaluations, please put those on your comments to say, you know, we really would like a session on this and this and this. So we really feel that with classic ending at the end of the year, um, you know, we, the, the whole migration part of it is out of the equation now, right? So we can focus on the enhancements and things like that and really focus on, you know, um, trying to get as much training as we can in with you guys like we did this year. Um, but, you know, we will all have time to really focus on the software as it is. Forget about classic, forget about migrations and just focus on all the new fun things that um, are going to be added to the software and improved. So we're, we're looking forward to 23 for sure. Um, so do you have any questions? Okay, if not, um, we hope you all have a wonderful, wonderful um, weekend and um, enjoy it. I think it's gonna be another beautiful weekend and we will see you guys next week. Take care.